we're talking about honor in relationships. So I want to uh, cover a few different areas, but I want to spend the most time on honoring your leaders. So let's start uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. You guys hear me talk about this a lot. Uh, and basically, the Lord said, those who honor me, them I will honor. And then he went on to say, and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. And so it's so important that we choose of our own accord to honor God with our life. Amen? And when we honor God with our life, then what happens? He honors us. That's right. Thank you, Riley. <laughs> we got, well, I got one with me. Come on. When we honor God, what happens? He honors us. So we're talking about honoring God in our relationships today. And I want to start uh, by talking about honoring our enemies. You know, we don't think about honoring our enemies in our flesh. We think about what? getting even. Come on, somebody. <laughs> right? Our flesh wants to get even. We feel totally justified in that feeling of, of desiring to get even. But the Bible says we're to love our enemies. Amen? Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Let's turn over there and look at it. Put your eyes on the scripture. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. That's not the right scripture. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Where is that? What is it? 544. Hey, let's go, PC. <laughs> 544. That's my girl right there. Jesus, what did he say? Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. That does not come naturally. Your flesh does not be like, let's just bless them that curse us today. No. Our flesh, when we get punched, we want to punch them back, right? When people talk trash, we want to talk trash back. But Jesus said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So we're talking about our relationship with our enemies. The Bible very clearly says that we're to love our enemies, that we're to bless our enemies, that we're to pray for our enemies. And when we do that, see, when we honor people, that's an honor to God. When we do the honorable thing, when our enemies comes, come against us, that's an honor to God. That means he's glorified in our actions. And I don't know about you, but I want my life to bring him glory every single day. Is anybody with me? So I know that I'm going to have to crucify my flesh. I know that I'm going to have to put my flesh under. I know that I'm going to have to take a deep breath. And instead of responding when something happens, or reacting rather, instead of just reacting flippantly, ca you know, casually, quickly reacting, I'm going to have to stop. And I'm going to say, what is the biblical response to what just happened? And, and you have to be intentional about your life in order to do that. Otherwise, if you just allow your flesh to react, you'll do the wrong thing every single time. But we crucify our flesh. That means we put our flesh under. Amen? Amen? So, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7. I love this. Turn over there. Let's put our eyes on it. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7. We're still talking about our relationship with our enemies. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, what happens? He makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. So when we do the honorable thing, when we do the right thing, when we do the correct thing, when we do the biblical thing, God makes even our enemies to be at peace with us. That's an amazing promise from the word of God. But listen, if you don't first learn to pray for your enemies, to bless those that curse you, and pray for those who despitefully use you, you know, if you don't learn to do that, then your ways aren't going to be pleasing to the Lord. So it's one thing to be like, yeah, that sounds good. I'd love for my enemies to be at peace with me. Well, that's great. But we have to be willing to do what the Bible says in order to receive that promise. Amen? So that's how it pertains to our enemies. Let's talk about how it pertains to our peers. Turn to John chapter 15, verse 13. And I don't want to spend a lot of time here, even though I could, because I'm so passionate about this. I'm, I'm passionate about how you guys treat each other. I was watching some of y'all at camp, and I saw some of the older guys putting their arm around the younger guys, and I was just like, oh, my, like my heart melted. 
because I saw them taking their place of leadership. I saw them seeing for their self that they have a responsibility to lead those who are younger than them. And it was just like, I'm like low-key taking pictures of you guys, and you guys got your arms around each other, and you guys are hugging each other. It was so awesome. So it says in, in John chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus speaking here. How many of you think Jesus knows a thing or two about what our conduct should look like? Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for who? For his friend. Now, we could talk for a long time about uh, this verse of Scripture and many more just like it, but what does it mean to lay down your life for your friend? (laughs) Wow. Thank God we didn't have the microphone. (laughs) Die. (laughs) Okay. No, no, you know, yeah, but, but like... In the, in the general sense of your life, right, you're not going to go out there and try and find a way to die for your friend, <laughs> right? What does it mean to lay down your life for your friend? All right, let's get the mics out now that we've got the... I heard a good one over here. Just go ahead and start with Trey. Okay, hold on. Wait for it. Is the microphone on? It's the Sennheiser. Yeah, Jaden. Hello. There you go. To put others before yourself. Great example. So in our relationship with our peers, in our relationship with our friends, to die, <laughs> to lay down your life for your friend, not necessarily just to die. <laughs> she was like leaning down, taking notes. So she's like, die. <laughs> That's a great answer, Trey. Who else? Miguel. And then her. Yeah. To be selfless. To be selfless. So give me an example of being selfless. Um, like Trey said, just putting yourself before others. And like not only them, but like their opinion. Putting others stuff. before yourself. Like what they think. Yeah. Like putting their, them, like not only them, but like, like what they want to do and stuff before, before you. Great answer, Miguel. Jenna? To, like, spend time with them and just steward the relationship you have. Very good. Very good. To, like, actually spend quality time with them. Maybe quality time is not your love language, but maybe you know your friend's love language is quality time. Then you'd be like, all right, let's do this. So, like, sometimes Pastor Charity wants to play board games, and I, like, reluctantly will play board games. Totally, totally not true. I do. I sit at that round table, and I play those games. Because of my love for you. What does it mean to lay down your life for your friends? Thank you. Scrabble. To put their feelings above yours. Okay, good answer. Brenda? To like, like if I got to choose what we ate yesterday, to kind of like let them and... Boom. Great answer. Hey, you know what? I picked where we were going to eat yesterday. Why, I'm going to defer to you. Why don't you pick where we're going to go today? Who is over here? Jax. To be there for them. To be there for them. Great. What would be an example of being there for your friend? Like, um, like if they asked you if, they're, if you, they, you are going to the party, they say yes. Then they are going. If not, like. Just slash their tires. If they, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he shook his head, yeah. If they say they're going to the party, you just slash their tires so they can't go to the party. <laughs> to be there for them, to tell them the truth, right? Hey, I don't think you should go there. Why don't me and you go to Sonic and get some slushies or whatever they have at Sonic? <laughs> I was going to say double cheeseburgers, but I refrain. All right, right here. To um, prefer, like, their conversations before yours. Ooh, like, that's good. Always Maybe talk about yourself. Very good. Maybe don't always talk about yourself. Maybe don't do all of the talking in the relationship. Can I get an amen? amen? There's such a thing as oversharing, which means you're doing all the sharing. <laughs> all right, here we go, right here on front row. To, like, give up your time, like, and not like make excuses that you can Ooh, do something. That's like, good. You have time to do it. That's good. Let's get him queued up next. She said, "Give up your time," which means you're not too busy for your friends. Amen. Or you're like pretend like, um, you know, they ask you to do something. You're like, "No, I can't. I, I have to uh, do laundry." Like, what? You don't even know how to do laundry. All right. 
At a restaurant? Did Pay I for them at a restaurant. Great answer. Last one. Oh. Right here. <laughs> Guys, we're talking about honoring our peers. To so do what they want. Do what they want to do. What was the last thing? When you're hanging out. When you're hanging out. Do what they want to do, right? So obviously these are all just natural things, but what about the deeper things like maybe saying something that you know they may not necessarily receive? What about being bold enough to tell them the truth even when it seems like, you know, it would just be easier to just like low-key like not mention this because like I don't want to deal with their attitude or whatever, you know? And, and, And there may be people in your life where eventually... After you continue speaking the truth and love into their life, eventually they put a distance between you and them because of their unwillingness to be receptive. But you know what? Did you know that God is patient and he's kind and he's long-suffering? How many of you are thankful that God has been so long-suffering with you? Okay, put your hands down. How many of you have had a little bit of a challenge being long-suffering with your friends? Guys, me too. Me too. I've had a challenge being patient with people the way I expect my father God to be patient with me. I've had a challenge being long-suffering with people that do things that are challenging to me. But how many of you know if we're endeavoring to be conformed to his image, then we should look more and more and more like him. It doesn't mean you put up with nonsense. It doesn't mean you let people run you over. It just means you just keep being bigger than that person is annoying. You just keep being bigger as a leader than that person is receptive. Like, okay, you're not receptive. Well, guess what? I'm a huge leader. I'm like a world-class leader, so I'm just going to keep believing in you. I'm just going to keep speaking the truth into your life because that's the kind of leader I am. That's the kind of friend I am. I'm a good friend, and I'm just going to believe God that six years from now or four years from now or someday it's going to click, and you're going to see it, right? That's why we pray that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. You know, at the end of the day, all of us have idiosyncrasies or, or different little things, little quirks, things about us that are weird that bug other people, right? But how many of you know God didn't give up on us just because we're a little bit weird? Now, we want to work on those things. We want to work on those quirks. We don't want to, you know, be that kind of person that's, like, challenging to be around. But as a friend, as a peer, we want to be the kind of friend or peer who's gracious, who's patient, who doesn't like, can't wait for that person to leave so that I can talk to my friend about how annoying they are. Do you know what I'm saying? That's not good. That's not honoring to your friend. That's not honoring to God. So if we're going to live lives that are honorable to God, we have to do the honorable thing as it pertains to our peers. We have to be like Jesus, patient, kind, long-suffering. We have to yield to the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Parents, 15.4, Matthew 15.4. Turn over there, put your eyes on this. Matthew 15, 4. What did Jesus say? He said, honor your father and mother. He that cursed his father or mother, let him die the death. That sounds like lay down your life for your friend. Die, die. (laughs) Die the death. (laughs) <laughs> honor your father and mother he that curses his father and mother let him die the death but you say whosoever shall say to his father or mother it is a gift by whatsoever you may profit profit by me and honor not his father and his mother shall be free thus you have made the commandment of god of none effect by your traditions you guys are hypocrites well did isaiah prophesy of you saying this people draw nigh to me with their mouth but their heart is far from me It goes on to say in um, Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll look at it here in just a second. It it talks about when you honor your father and mother, what does the Bible promise? Does anybody remember? Long life. But I love that that verse kind of talks about, you know, when people are saying they're misconstruing the word of God. And so many times people say, well, I do this and this and this for my parents. They want to talk about all these different things. But really it's a heart issue. It's a matter of understanding that, you know what, my parents aren't perfect. But I still have a responsibility. Everybody say responsibility. I still have a responsibility to honor them. Right? If, if you only had to honor your parents when they're perfect, then no one would have to honor their parents. Because nobody's perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. 
But the Bible doesn't say honor your parents when they're perfect. It says honor your father and mother. So maybe you don't have a father or mother in the home. Maybe you have a parent or, or maybe you don't have a parent, but you have a guardian. You need to honor them the same way that the Bible instructs to honor a father or mother. You need to honor them and say thank you for, for buying me clothes or whatever they do for you. You need to be honorable and say thank you for putting a roof over my head. Thank you for, for buying this meal for me. You need to be thankful. You can cultivate that and honor them. And when they ask you to do something, do it. See, a lot of times parents come to us and they have an issue when, when their student is like ready to like mop up the communion off the floor and run and take out the trash. And they got the zeal of God, just the fire of God consuming them, being about the father's business. And you're all about it here. But then when you go home and they ask you to do something, what happens? Oftentimes, nothing. Or you cop an attitude. Right? Like, I don't want to. I'm you know, and, and a lot of times that's what happens. You get up. You know, you're a little sleepy when you get here. We get our praise on. We're dancing. We're jumping. We're shouting. You know, all of a sudden the blood is pumping. Everything's going good. Right? You're, having, you're receiving communion. You're receiving the word. You're serving. You're making all these funny videos. Everything's going great. But then you get home and you're like, oh. I'm ready for a nap. I'm just ready. I'm going to turn on the ceiling fan, turn off the light, let the air conditioning just roll. Right? Anybody ever been there before? And you don't feel like doing anything. Well, it's in those moments when you decide if you're going to do the honorable thing or if you're going to do what your flesh wants. Right? And so sometimes you have to crucify your flesh and be like, you know what? I did have a big day and we did do a lot. But my, my parents asked me to do this or to do that. So I'm just going to jump up and I'm just going to get it done. That's the honorable thing to do. And when you honor your parents in that way, you're promised long life. Let's look at the Bible. It says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, that you may live long upon the earth. How many of you want to live long and not die for your friends? <laughs> Just kidding. All right, let's talk about our leaders because um, this really was strong in my heart to talk to you guys about honoring your relationship with your leaders. Matthew chapter 4, let's look at verse 19. Jesus said to his disciples, what did he say? Follow me. Everybody say follow. Follow. Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You know, so many people have a tough time following. It's like they just want to be in charge. They just want to be the leader. You know? And there's nothing wrong with being the leader. But if you're not a good follower, the Bible says you'll never be a true leader. You may start something. You may have a few people following you, but what you're doing is not for him. Pastor Charity makes this statement. She says, if it's not from him, it's not for him. And how true that is. You see so many people doing many, many things, but we don't know, and we really won't know until the end, which things were truly of him and which things were of man. I don't know about you, but I want to do the things that are for him. I want to do the things that are of him. And so Jesus, very strongly, he didn't make any apologies. He said, follow me. He wasn't asking. He was saying, this is what's required. You want to you be a disciple of mine? Follow me. Everybody say, follow me. Okay. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. We reference these verses of Scripture often as it pertains to your pastors. The Bible says in verse 7, remember them which have the rule over you. Who have spoken the word of God to you. Whose faith follow. Everybody say follow. follow. The Bible instructs you to remember those who are teaching you and training you in the word. And to follow their faith. Everybody say follow. Then it says, consider the end of their conversation. You can consider their life. You can follow those who through faith and patience are inheriting the promises of God. Amen? Then it goes in verse 17. It says, obey them that have the rule over you. Everybody say obey. Obey, obey is not our flesh's favorite word. Right? But when you're spiritual, when you're a man of God or a woman of God, you know that obedience brings blessing. So your flesh is going to buck obedience. 
and say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this. Flesh is ugly and flesh is destructive. But we don't walk after the flesh. We walk after the spirit. So that's why we must be spiritual. That's why we must spend time in God's word, reading God's word, meditating God's word. And not only that, but doing. Everybody say doing. You can know a lot of the word and do very little or none of the word. And you know what? I know people who may not know as much of the word, but bless God, they endeavor to do what it is that they know to do. And I tell you what, I'd rather spend time with somebody who maybe doesn't know all the scripture and doesn't know all the stories in the Bible, but they're, they're stewarding what it is that they have revelation of to do in the Bible. And you know what? It's in that stewardship and in that faithfulness that God will take them from faith to faith and from glory to glory. And, and he'll, he'll help them to grow. Because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to who? The humble. He doesn't give grace to the person who knows all the scriptures and exactly where they are. He gives grace to people who are humble. So verse 13 is very, very clear. It says, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow and consider their conversations. That's seven. Verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you. Submit yourselves. Everybody say submit. Submit. Mm. So many people have a tough time with that word, submit. Now, I thank God that I am a second born. So I had a big brother, and I just followed, and I just did whatever he did. If he took his motorcycle off of the terrace, I took my motorcycle off the terrace. If he jumped off the road and went down in the ditch and jumped somebody's driveway, I did the exact same thing. I just followed every single thing. If he was going to the gym early in the morning, I was going to the gym early in the morning. If he was playing football, I was playing football. If he was running track, I was running track. I've literally been programmed my whole childhood, my whole upbringing to follow. Everybody say follow. Following is such a powerful thing if you're following the right person. See, that's why we get a little bit, um, hmm, what's the word? Um, You know, I guess I would say it hurts our heart to see people following random YouTube preachers that they have no accountability with, right? If they don't have a shepherd in their life, if if they don't have a pastor, because we know that the second that that YouTube person that they love so much says something that comes against their flesh or says something that's corrective, what can they do? Change the channel, turn it off. So easy. But it's people who have enough wisdom to say, I'm going to submit myself. I'm going to come up under my leaders. Then I'm going to allow them to bring corrective words into my life. It's those people who are safe. It's those people who are truly planted. And it's those people who will flourish. Everybody say flourish. So it says, submit yourselves. For they watch over your souls. They must give an account. But that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for who? For you. So, so we have a responsibility, but so do you. Just like myself, Pastor Faith, Pastor Charity, we want to we wanna endeavor to make it easy for Pastors Dean and Kathy to pastor us. That's our responsibility. In the same way, it's your responsibility to make it easy for us to help you and to shepherd you. Now, let's turn real quick to Genesis chapter 2, because I know you guys know this, but rebellion is not a new <laughs> development. It's been around for a minute, right? He, uh, Genesis chapter 2, let's start in verse 15. Turn quick. Go to Genesis 2. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to dress it and to keep it. Everybody say assignment. God gave man an assignment. Verse 16. And the Lord God commanded them saying, cl- commanded man saying, Every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely do what? Die. <laughs> you didn't know you were going to be such a part of my sermon today. Die. What does it mean to lay down your life for your friend? Die. <laughs> And the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help me. So God put the man in the garden, gave him an assignment, told him, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then God says, it's not good that man should be alone. So the way my Bible reads, it's like God gave Adam the instruction not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And so it goes on, uh, says not good that man should be alone. Then he does some awesome stuff. He takes from Adam's rib, right? Verse 22. 
And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. No, no mama's boys up in here. Come on, somebody. And shall cleave unto his wife. Glory to God. And they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife. And they were not ashamed. Hallelujah. God's design. No shame. Then what happens in chapter 3? The serpent. Everybody say the serpent. The serpent. He was more subtle. Listen, when people are real slick and slick and super smooth, I get super scared. Like, no. No, I don't want nothing to do with that. I distance myself from slick, sly, charismatic people. It says the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which... The Lord God had made. He said unto the woman, Has God said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. That's right. Thank you so much. You guys are catching on. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Right. So immediately Satan contradicts what God said. God said, you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. Satan says, no, you won't. Right? He immediately contradicts what God had said. That's why your leaders are so important. See, the enemy's constantly going to contradict what God said. He's constantly going to counterfeit. The Bible says that when Satan lies, he's the father of lies. That means he lies of his own resource. He just oozes. That's all he does is lie. And so it goes on to say, in verse 6, when the, women saw, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, everybody say saw. She's walking by sight, y'all. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. She's walking by sight, y'all. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her. Everybody say with her. And he did eat. You know, God commanded them very clearly saying not to eat of the fruit of the tree. But they did. They disobeyed. You know, and so I think the enemy tries to use that when, when maybe we appear frustrated or we appear mad. We're not mad at you. We're not, fr- like, necessarily just frustrated with you. It's that, that the decisions that you're making are frustrating to us as your leaders because we know that the wages of sin is death. And we don't want you to experience death. We don't want you to die. That's right. Thank you. So how many of you in here are in sixth grade? Wow, a lot of sixth graders. Okay, hands down. Let me see seventh graders. Yeah, seventh grade. What's up? All right, eighth graders. Let me see the eighth graders. Wow. Ninth? Nice. Tenth? Wow. Eleven? Very good. Twelve? Yeah. All right, so listen, pretty good representation all the way across the board. And I think what times, oftentimes people misunderstand is the fact that uh, this is not like our first year in ministry. So let's say we got, you know, 10 10th graders. This is not my first 10 10th graders I've been watching. Let's just say, I mean, we've been doing, I mean, I started in ministry in 99, hey, with John George, I was traveling with John George. Guys, we were doing storm camps before storm camps ever. Right, we were doing, what were those weekend things we did in Rio Doso? Uh, Winterfest, we were doing Winterfest in Rio Doso. I was snowboarding, I was a total idiot, right? But over the years, I was a good snowboarder though, but even though I was an idiot. So then in 2003, I, I moved here. Began working with 5th and 6th graders, then began working with 7th and 8th graders, then working with 6th through 12th. And so I've seen year after year, literally for, for years, I've been watching 6th graders and 7th graders and 8th graders. And so think, if I, if I see a group of 10 10th graders, and then the next year I see 10 more 10th graders, and then it's, it's like, this is not, you're not my first 10th grader I've ever watched. You're like my 112th, 10th grader, and I know exactly what you choose is going to determine what you get in life. So if we seem, hmm, 
What's the word? If we seem a little intense, it's because we are. It's because we're fighting for your life. We're fighting for your future. Because I know how this plays out. And I know what the, like, uh, you know, the flags are. I, I know what the indicators are. Because I've seen, you, you understand? I'm not saying that from a prideful place, you know. Like a parent can think, well, you've never been a parent before. I've never been a parent before. But I've watched 112 10th graders very closely. And they know exactly how this plays out depending on their actions. Does that make sense? And I want you to succeed. But it depends on how you esteem your leaders. It depends on how you esteem those who have been set over you. Everybody say over. Over. You know, this is so common. And and, um, I just think one of the things I love about the military is that there is a chain of command. Everybody say chain of command. What does that mean? Who knows what chain of command means? What is it? Order. Very good. Different levels. Good answer. Both good answers. What? Yeah. Yeah. It's like the, it's like I'm taking all these words, the order of power. Does everybody understand that? Everybody say order. You know, order is something that you have to learn. And if you, if, you, if you buck authority in the military, one of a few things happen and they're all bad. You probably will get publicly humiliated by your superior, meaning he will make a show of you openly because he's not going to allow you to buck his authority publicly and get away with it. Do you understand that? And then there, there's other repercussions, uh, you know, potentially demoted. Like, literally, people can be demoted in the military, or they could just be kicked out. They could be dishonorably discharged. That means we got rid of you because you were dishonorable. You know, I think the body of Christ could probably do a little bit better in some dishonorable discharges. As a matter of fact, I think I might get good at dishonorable discharges. Like, even recently, there was a situation in there was a young man, and, and I was kind of working with him, and I, I wanted to include him, and I wanted him to be a part, but there were some things where it was just like there was some friction, and it was like I knew he was capable, and I knew he had tons of potential, and I knew he was a go-getter, but I just, I'm like, what is, what is, the, what is the rub here? And I think what it is, and I was just kind of even meditating on it, is I think that in his insecurity, he was trying to overperform, yeah. and inadvertently was not going in order. And so there were some things that I'd ask him to do. And he's like, well, we could do it this way. And we need to do it this way. And we have this and we can do it this way. And I'm just sitting there and I'm just like, duh, just kidding. I didn't say, I didn't think that. It was like, I was frustrated because it's like, now I'm, now I'm questioning what I just said to do because of your response. That's wrong. Because he didn't understand order, he caused me to question myself, even though I knew. And you know what? I went back and I said, no, do it the way I said. And then when it all played out, it was a good thing we did it my way. Because had we done it his way, it would have been bad. Because God is a God of order. And actually, I I look forward to having an opportunity to, to articulate that to him. Because at the time, I didn't understand it. But that's all it was. It was just an overzealousness, which to be overzealous in and of itself, you know, I'd rather have somebody who's zealous than somebody who's like, are they breathing? Check, check for a pulse. You know, I, I like the zeal. I like the energy, but never at the expense of honor of order. Does that make sense? And so when you guys t- l- learn to honor, even, even me, Pastor Charity will tell you, I, I'm always saying, let me check with Pastor Dean. Now, I, because I've been in relationship with Pastor Dean, I've been under him long enough, I know he respects me and I know he respects my decision, but I often want to make sure that I'm doing what he wants me to do. Now, there's certain times where there's little situations and out of honor for him, I, I say, you know what, I'm going to take care of this so he doesn't even have to know that this petty crap happened. And so all of my own accord, I'll deal with it and I'll make the decision. But there's other times where in my spirit, I just want to check with him and make sure that I'm doing what he would have me to do. What is that? That's honor. And that's like almost lost in our generation. It's like young people are just talking behind closed doors about how trash their leader is. And I can't believe this. They did this. And I can't believe they did that. And they can't wait for their chance to go and be in charge. Do you know the Bible says it doesn't work that way? So foolish. Everybody say foolish. 
So we're talking about our relationship with our leaders. Proverbs 26, 11 says, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. What does folly mean? That just means foolishness. And that word return, returning to foolishness means repeating foolishness. It's like if you make a stupid mistake and your leader lovingly corrects you, but then you go and do it again, that's foolish. Why would you return to your foolishness? To repent means to turn away, to quit. Right? I'm done with that. Repent is not just like, I confess it before you, Lord. Okay, I repented, and then go do it again. No, repentance is change. Repentance is quitting. Repentance is turning away. So that's why we as your leaders, when we bring correction, we're looking for the fruit of repentance. I've been a leader for a lot of years, and I've seen people who said they were repentant, so I went with that. But the fruit of their life showed that they weren't repentant. And then I've had other people who drew a line in the sand and left all that crap behind, which says to me they are repentant. Why? Because the fruit of their life shows that they're repentant. So Proverbs 13, 15, good understanding, give a favor. But the way of the transgressor is what? Hard. So when we correct you, when we teach you, when we say don't do this and don't do that, it's because we know the way of the transgressor is hard. Verse 16, every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly or his foolishness. See, and that's the thing that I think so, so many times young people don't understand is that I've seen folly a lot. I know what folly looks like. I know what foolishness looks like. And guess what? You check all the boxes. <laughs> Not saying you. I'm just saying in that scenario. And so what happens is when I say, hey, this is foolish, and they say, no, it's not, or they say, that's not me, that's not true, when it's like all the fruit of their life lines up with that level of folly. So you have to understand that your leader's heart's desire is not to make up a list of things that you're doing wrong. It's our responsibility to watch over your life carefully, and when we see things that are a problem, tell you about it so that you can change. Verse 17, a wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is health. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12 says, be not slothful. What does it mean to be slothful? You know laziness will cost you? Man, it will cost you. It says, be not slothful, but be followers. Everyone say followers. Followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We, we referenced this earlier. That's Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. Listen, if you're lazy... That's a problem. And you need to deal with it now. Everybody say now. now. So laziness will cost you. Now to follow means you're going to act according to, you're going to conform to, you're going to imitate, you're going to copy. I just think about like when someone's following me, like let's say I'm driving and I got the destination and my navigation. As a leader, I'm, I'm paying attention to where they are. Like, when I get in the right lane, I want them to get in the right lane. When I put my blinker on, they should be putting their blinker on. When, I'm, when I put my blinker on, because maybe we got a left-hand turn coming up, and I'm waiting for my chance to get in the next lane, you know, a good follower, you know what they'll do? Maybe, I, maybe no one's letting me in. A good follower will actually turn on their blinker. I'm following you, and I see that you desire to go left. And they jump in that lane, and they slow down. What does that do? That creates a gap for me also to get in there and to continue to lead. That's what a good follower looks like. A bad follower is like, yeah, I, I knew you were in the left lane and I was going to get over, but I was just going to do it later, right? They're so casual. They're so flippant. They want to do it their way. So there's a difference in following well and just kind of following. Do you understand? I want to be a good follower. I want to make it easy for Pastor Dean to lead me. And did you know that that's my responsibility? And in the exact same way, it's your responsibility to be a good follower. Y'all with me? So laziness will cost you. Allowing yourself to be distracted will cost you. You know, not, everyone's, uh, not everyone has this big ulterior motive or this ambition, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do it my way. Not everyone's wired that way. Some people are just casual, yeah. and they're just lazy. So there's two sides of the spectrum, and they're both dangerous. Let's turn to Luke chapter 16, verse 12. We're still talking about following our leaders. 
But these verses of Scripture make it so clear that, number one, it's our responsibility. Number two, it's important how we follow. And they also bring clarity as to why we're to follow. And I'm just thinking about this. As I think about you guys and, and the great things that God has called you to, this verse of Scripture is so vitally important that you grasp this truth and that you hold on to this truth and that you meditate this truth. It will help you. Luke chapter 16 and verse 12. Again, we keep referring to Jesus because he's awesome. Verse 12, Jesus said, If you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who will give you that which is your own? You know, so many people in my generation, they just want something that's their own. And the Bible says very clearly, listen, if you want something that's your own, let me tell you where to start. Why don't you start with something that's not your own? And why don't you show me how faithful you can be? Why don't you show me how honorable you can be why don't you show me how good you can follow and then we'll see what might be available for that which is your own and and it's very possible that God has for some of you in this room something that is your own but if you can't even be faithful over that which is another man's God will not give you something that is your own so if you grasp that and you take hold of that and you take that seriously it will compel you to be a good follower amen if you're serious about having something that's your own be a good follower Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, be ye followers of God as dear children. You know, we talked about uh, Satan tricking Adam and Eve. We talked about Lucifer, uh, you know, uh, being so crafty and so subtle and convincing her that she would not die. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 14, 12, how art, thou, how, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart. The Bible says this is what Lucifer's heart said. I will ascend into heaven. You hear the arrogance? And I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit upon the mount of the congregations in the sides of the north. And I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. And I will be like the most high. That sounds to me a lot like people that I've known. They're like, I'm going to do this. and God's called me to do this. And I'm going to have this Bible study. And I'm going to lead the men. And I'm going to. And I'm thinking, why don't you. Do the last thing Pastor Dean asked you to do. And that's what I said in the meeting. <laughs> hey, bro, just help with the deep tables. I mean, maybe start there. <laughs> or not, we'll sling them without you. Matter of fact, I like it better when you're not here because you're weird. Everybody say, don't be weird. This same tone that we hear from Lucifer, I will do this, and I will do that, and I have a ministry. You know, I've heard that before. <laughs> doesn't go well for that kind of person because they don't understand what the book of Luke teaches us about being a steward over that which is another man's. If you ever expect to have that which is your own. See, it wasn't even maybe that that person wasn't capable of or couldn't have done a, you know, maybe, maybe done that, but because of their unfaithfulness, they disqualified themselves. So we, I wasn't holding them back from doing that. They were. So don't get this twisted thing in your head straight out of the pit of hell that your leader's holding you back. No, it's your leader's responsibility to give you opportunities to prove yourself faithful. And if, everybody say if. If you actually prove yourself faithful, which takes time. Everybody say time. It would be like if that person's like, all right. I did the deep tables last week. Can I do my thing now? <laughs> wow. No. You're so jacked up. You, you think you checked off the box that you did this one thing and now you're qualified? You don't have a clue what faithfulness looks like. Do you understand? So it's not that your leader's against you. It's that this is God's order. So if you're a leader, the Bible talks about that. Do not promote a novice. Don't promote somebody quickly. 
The Bible talks about being intentional. Even lay hands suddenly on no man. We should be spirit-led and intentional in every single decision of our life. And that's a big responsibility. So Satan said, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do them. And God said, you will be brought low. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. (laughs) Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 15, verse 14. Let them alone, for they are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, what happens? Both fall into a ditch. Who you're following absolutely matters. So it's not just about you being a good follower. It's about you following the right person. And what we see, because we know that Satan actually took a third of the angels with him. Revelation talks about that. Right? That Satan not only fell like lightning, but his, the tail of the dragon swooped a third of the stars with him. And so 33% of those angels were convinced they were tricked. Everybody say tricked. Satan convinced them. He tricked them into following. And what happened? It cost them. So there may be people even in your life that try to, hmm... I'm trying to think of the right word, but basically, I've seen it happen many times. I recognize it immediately. They try to develop influence in your life, and it has nothing to do with your life. has everything to do with their agenda. Wow. has everything to do with them trying to build a following, trying to build a support system underneath their ministry, their anointing, their calling. I've seen it happen. There's different terms for it uh, in different books, but basically it's a gathering of people to try to build something within something. So it would be like if somebody kind of tried to swoop in and and kind of tried to try to undermine Pastor Dean a little bit and kind of draw people away. Oh, snap. Everybody say, oh, snap. The Bible said that's not good. The Bible said it doesn't go well for that person. The Bible says that God hates when someone sows discord among the brethren. And so they will give an account for that. Amen? Matthew. We talked about this earlier, but let's talk about it again. 15.8. This people draws near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Being a leader for many years, I've seen many people say the right things to me and I'm not jaded but also I'm not going by what you say I'm going by what I see that's great you've articulated I want to do this and I'm going to do that and I believe in you and I will agree with you and I'll 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 coach you and help you and thank you for bringing me into the ring and and I'll be with you in that but it's going to really come down to you making tough decisions and there being some fruit in your life Because I've talked to people about things, and I've said, okay, this is what you said, then do this, and then they don't do it. What, 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 What do I do from there? Because the word said one thing, but the action said another. That's in the Bible. People draw near to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So we can make changes. And when we see, listen, when you see behavior in your life, I'm like, that's ugly. Anybody been there besides me? Come on. We've all seen ugly behavior in our life. We don't be like, oh, my gosh, I guess I'm total trash. I guess I'll give up now. No. Just change it. Just get right in your heart. Just say, Father, I see that pride. My God, that is so ugly. Lord, I need your help. Help me. Help me. Show me what to do. I was talking with a young man recently. And he was talking about um, pride in his life. And I said, I see that. And I was just joking with him. (laughs) I said, I can see that strong in your life. That's a stronghold, I think. I'm messing with him. (laughs) I was messing with him. Sometimes I just mess with people. I think it's one of my love languages. So if I mess with you, it's only because I deeply love you. But when you see those things, you have to do something about it. Right? Just like if a person's like, oh, my gosh, I hate the way I look in the mirror. Well, do something. Like, Pastor, I'm going to go Pastor Faith on y'all. Go to the gym. Stop eating five for five like it was built for one person, right? Stop eating the family pack like, like it was built for you. It was built for a family, okay? <laughs> I used to do that in college. Like, Arby's would have five for five. I would eat five roast beef sandwiches. So did Pastor Faith. Did you do that? No, I did the brown bag 
she did the brown bag special, which was like supposed to be for two people. <laughs> but Pastor Faith was kind of like two people, but she was only one. <laughs> it was a double. It was the year of the double for Pastor Faith. And she got that brown bag special, y'all, and she just enjoyed it. And that was her decision to make. And then at some point in her life, she decided, I don't like this. Thank God. What did she do? She changed. She did three a days. She stopped eating. She's still not eating to this day. <laughs> yes, I am. She could barely say it. <laughs> Get her some cheese. But I, I respect that she had enough self-control to start doing things differently. Okay, she quit drinking Coke how long ago? 28 years, just kidding. A long time. I've quit drinking Coke like 28 times. <laughs> Maybe more. So if you don't like it, what do you do? You change. See, beating yourself up and being negative is counterproductive. And listen, when I bring these things strong, and, and sometimes I'll pull you guys aside and I'll tell you these things. And a lot of times I'll tell you, hey, I didn't, I didn't say this publicly because my heart is not to embarrass you. But I'm telling you privately, you need to change this. That's love. If I didn't care about your life, I wouldn't pull you aside and say those things. So your leaders are actually a gift. Your leaders are your greatest ally. But if you treat it like there's a void or you treat it like it's you versus us as your leaders, that's your fault. Because that's not the truth and that's not how we see it. Even if you see it that way, that's your bad. Let me end on this verse here. We got just a couple minutes left here. Two verses because I want to end. Let me give you three because these are all important and I saved them for last Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Young man, young woman, don't resent it when God chastens you or corrects you, for his punishment is proof of his love. Everybody say proof of his love. Same thing. We, we're like under shepherds, under pastors, Dean and Kathy, who are under shepherds of the Lord Jesus, who's the head of the church. So when we correct you, don't be mad. Don't be all butthurt. Don't be all pouty. Don't be all like, eh, eh, eh. Just accept it, humble yourself, and change. Who the Lord loves, he corrects. Same way. We as your leaders, because we love you, we correct you. Just as the father punishes a son, uh, and he delights to make him better, so the Lord corrects you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 through 8. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure, everybody say endure. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Listen, in the same way, maybe you're like, oh, I don't have an earthly father who, who chastens me. Hey, thank God you're in a good church where you have leaders who love you and who will correct you and who will chasten you. And, and the word and God will be a father to the fatherless. And when he brings that correction, you have a choice. I'm going to take that and I'm going to receive that and I'm going to cherish that and I'm going to do something with it. And you show forth your appreciation for God and his love for you by being obedient to the corrections that he brings. And finally, in 3 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, even as you walk in truth. Verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. We, as your leaders, we have no greater joy then when we see you begin to have fruit in your life because of the seed of God's word that you've put in your heart. That's our greatest joy is to see you guys. Even when you're worshiping, yeah. even when you're down front at fire week or you're jumping or you're, or you're praising the Lord or, or, or you got your arm around somebody who's younger than you guys with guys, girls with girls. Come on. I've seen, some, I've seen way too many guys chasing girls in ministry. <sighs> It's no greater joy for us than to see you guys walk in the truth. And you know what? Just like the Lord's mercies are new every morning, and we told, we told the leaders this. 
Hey, maybe you have a student that like hates your guts and wants to make your life miserable. Your mercies need to be new every single morning with them. Why? Because we want you to know that we love you and we're for you and we're fighting for you. Even when we don't feel like it, we feel like fighting you in our flesh. But the nature of God in us is to love you and to help you and to correct you and to keep speaking the truth into your life. Do you know it would be easier for us to just try to be your friend and just kind of make it nice and just ask you how things are going and just keep it very surface and very shallow? But the leader that God has called us to be requires of us to, to require of you to, to go to the next level, to require more of yourself. And that's what we're going to, and I'm going to keep doing it. As long as people give me a chance, I'm going to keep telling them, hey, you're better than that. Better than that. Da 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 Why? Because we love you. No greater joy than to see you walk in the truth. So we love you as leaders. And we're fighting for you, but it's your job to honor your leaders. Amen.